Okay guys, how you doing? This is Alejandro Gonzalez once again catching up with the chapter 4 discussion that uh, we left off in last time. In this lecture we're going to talk about the continuation of the different thoughts that exist, or the connections actually that exist uh, between morality and religion. Today we're going to focus on what's known as the Divine Command Theory. And again, this is referencing your book, page 50 to 59. So before I get into the actual divine command theory, I, I do want to remind you that um, that in this in this monotheistic tradition that include all of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, you know God is conceived as as a sort of lawgiver. He is the one who sets the rules, and we are the ones to are supposed to obey them. He does not, however, compel us to obey them. It's of course uh, we are f created as free agents. We have our own free will. So. We may choose to accept or not to accept his commandments and his he and his teachings, um, but if we are able to live, we should live essentially through God's laws. Now, this conception uh, is something that has been elaborated by some theologians into what is known, like I said, a theory about the nature of right and the nature of wrong, and this is known as the divine command theory. And what essentially this is is a theory that states that that morality is right and that it is commanded by God and that morality is wrong being that it is forbidden by God or things that are immorally wrong are forbidden by God. This theory, however, has a lot of uh, attractive features to it. You know, it, it, it immediately solves and temporarily at that the problem about the, uh, the objectivity of ethics, if you will. You know, ethics is is not merely a matter of personal feeling or, or social or circumstances, but whether something is right or something is wrong is perfectly it's it's objective. It's it's if it's right, you know, it's because God commanded it. But if it's wrong, it's because God forbids it. Now, moreover, and to be more specific, the divine command theory suggests a sort of answer to this question of why anyone should bother with any morality. You know, why forget about ethics? And and it and it forces us to look at one's self you know if immorality is the violation of God's commandments therefore there's only one answer you know one day the, the final reckoning or judgment you will be held accountable for your actions however there is a couple of uh, there is a couple of serious problems for this theory or for this divine command theory you know of course atheists would not accept it at all because they do not believe that God exists period but there are difficulties even for believers. You know, the main problem that was first noted by Plato, a Greek philosopher, uh, who believed 400 years before the birth of Jesus. You know, Plato's writings were in the form of dialogue. As a matter of fact, they're called the dialogues of, of Plato, hence Socrates. But usually between Socrates, like I said, and one or more people who were objecting to this question. Now, in one of those dialogues that I believe you should have a copy of, which is... This book here, in one of those dialogues titled uh, Euthyphro, there is a discussion concerning what something could be called right, or what is it to be something defined called right. And that is something which was the gods command. You know, Socrates is very skeptic, and he asks, and, and, and he, is, he is one, the Socratic method is one that you must be familiar with, he asked that, is, is conduct right because the gods command it, or do the gods command it because it is right? Now, this is one of the most famous questions in history of all philosophy, of all moral philosophy, religious philosophy, and even Western philosophy. Um, there was a British philosopher named Flew who suggested that, I believe something somewhere along the lines that, that, that the good tests of a person's aptitude to philosophy is, is to discover whether or not he can grasp a certain point. Um, the point that he is referring to, of course, is the point that if we accept this sort of theological conception of right or wrong, we are caught in a dilemma. And what is this dilemma? Well, that's what we're going to get to. You know, Socrates' questions ask us to clarify what we mean. And as a philosopher and a student of philosophy or even a student of faith, you must realize that there are two things we, we mean when we say uh, this this dilemma and and both of them lead to trouble and I'm, it's almost a setting up for failure but um, first of all we might mean that um, right or good conduct is good or right because God commands it 
You know, for example, in Exodus chapter 20, it says that God commands us to be truthful. Now, on this option, the reason we should be truthful is simply because God requires it. God commands it. Now, apart from this divine command, truth-telling is neither good nor bad. So, it is God's command, essentially, that makes truthfulness right. Here's the trouble. Here's the dilemma. Um, it, in essence, represents God's commands as arbitrary. You know, it means that God could have given the command just as easily to lie. He could have commanded us to be liars, and then lying and not truthfulness would have been the right thing to do. Now, of course, someone who is of religion might be very tempted to reply, but God would never command us to lie. Well, why not? If he did endorse lying, God would not be commanding us to do wrong, but rather to do right. So, remember that on this view, honesty was not a good thing or a right thing before God commanded it. Therefore, he could have no reason to command it or command the opposite. So, from a moral point of view, his command is arbitrary. Remember that. You need to remember that very closely. Now, um, another problem that may exist on this on this arbitrary view is that the doctrine of goodness, or 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 in its, in essence, it's reduced to to nonsense. I mean, it is important to remember that religious believers believe that God is not only all powerful but also all knowing. You know, and He is good in, in nature. Yet, if we accept the idea that good and bad are defined by references of God's will, then I dare say that there is a notion of, of, of no meaning. You know, what could it mean to say that God's commandments are good? Well, um, if X is good, it means that X is commanded by God. You see? So then God's commands are good. would only mean that God's commands are commands by God. I know it's kind of confusing, but it'll get easier as we get into it. You know, and, and, and there is a, a sense of we can almost begin to talk about metaphysics, but I don't want to get too swayed into another, into another subject. But this is, there can be a metaphysical explanation to this, a transcendent metaphysical explanation. But um, we can talk about the second option. Uh, there is a way to avoid these troublesome consequences, if you will. We can take the second stage of Socrates' option, which is we need to say that right conduct is right because God commands it. You know, instead, we say that God commands us to do certain things because they are right. You know, God, who is infinitely wise, realizes that truthfulness is better than deceitfulness. And so he commands us to be truthful. He sees that killing is wrong, so he commands us not to kill. And so on and so forth for all these other moral and ethical rules. So, if you were to take this opinion, we avoid, in essence, the troublesome consequences that 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 troubled or that that spoiled the first alternative or the first option. You know, God commands us, and is not arbitrary. You know, they are a result of His wisdom and knowing what is best. And the doctrine of this goodness of God is preserved. So He, in essence, is good. And to say that His commands. Um, are good means that his commands are only that in his perfect wisdom are good but unfortunately there is some sort of discontent and this second option the second option for difficulties that leads to a certain problem which is equally troublesome and I could, like I said I'm kind of set you up for failure but we'll get into it in a bit you know in taking this this opposition the second view we have abandoned the theological concept we have abandoned the theological conception of right and wrong. You know, when we say that God commands us to be truthful because truthfulness is right, we are acknowledging or we are understanding the fact that a standard of right and wrong is independent from God's will. The rightness exists prior to any independent of God's command. And it is for this reason that He commands it. So, if we want to know why we should be truthful, the reply, well, because God commands it, does not really tell us anything. You know, for we can still ask, but why does God command it? And the answer to that question will provide an underlining issue or reason of why truthfulness is good. Um, like I said, this is, I'm going to briefly give you an example. There is something known as the paradox of the stone. And, and this paradox, while well, it was very famous throughout uh, Greek uh, and ancient philosophy, especially the Socratics, the, with the so Socratics, it states that 
um, is God capable of creating a rock that is so heavy that he himself cannot lift? Well, if you answer yes, God can create a rock that he cannot lift, but he can carry it himself, you're losing the fact, your validity or your reason says that God is, must not be omnipotent because he can't carry it. So then you can argue, well, God cannot create the rock. You know, God cannot create that rock which he cannot lift. Well, then you are saying that he is still not omnipotent because he cannot even create the rock to try and lift it. So you see how I kind of, again, set you up for failure. And um, we understand that many uh, religious people that accept this theological concept of right and wrong because it would be impious to do so, you know, they feel in an essence somehow that if they believe in God, they should say that right and wrong are to be defined in terms of His will. You know, we can think about Genesis. When we think about Genesis, God creates at will. There's no what is known as theogony. There's no biography of God. He just does it. He does it because it is His will. You know, but again, going back to the argument, this argument is, is, is can be said to suggest that the divine command theory itself leads, like I said, to an impious result, so that a devout person should not accept it. You know, if you are a person of faith, you should not accept this divine command theory. But in fact, some of the great theologians, which is going to be the next chapter that you discuss, some of the great theologians, such as Thomas of Aquinas, Alexandria of Origen, even St. Augustine of Hippo, rejected this theory for that simple reason, because they did not want to be considered pious religious people. You know, uh, thinkers such as Aquinas connected morality with religion, but in a very different way, in a very, very different way. And on a side note to that, um, for your bonus question that you're, that was imposed by the final term quiz, uh, I give you this book here. I'll give you a hint. This is Soren Kierkegaard's Kierkegaard was a, as a Christian. He was a Danish philosopher, but he was a religious philosopher. It sounds to be very parallel, but in fact, there were some philosophers who were uh, not pious, who believed in God, such as uh, Aquinas was one, Augustine of Hippo, obviously, uh, Origin of Alexandria. Not so much theologians, but more so philosophers. But uh, like I said, um, it's important to remember, and this is the keynote that I want you to take away from this, that theologians and even philosophers rejected the theory of the divine command theory because they did not want to be seen as pious. So they connected morality with religion, but in a different way. And this, that being said, uh, next lecture we'll talk about uh, morality through the eyes of what is known as natural law. But for now, I hope that this uh, lecture was helpful to you. Email me questions if you have any. Uh, all right, thanks guys.